Okay, so I think we're going to start. So welcome, uh, uh, welcome all to the CIB, uh, to the virtual CIB computational biology seminar series. Today we have the pleasure to have uh, Ute Rumpig, uh, a senior uh, research scientist at the Molecular Modeling Group here at the uh, CIB Institute of Bioinformatics. Um, she was trained at physical as a physical chemist at the Ludwig Maximilians University uh, in Munich, Germany. Uh, where uh, she obtained in uh, 2004 a PhD in computational chemistry at the Swiss uh, Federal Institute of Technology of Zurich in Switzerland. Then from 2005 to 2006, she was a postdoctoral research assistant at the Enrico Fermi Research Center, Rome, Italy. And then from uh, 2006 to 2011, Ute did a second postdoc uh, at the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research and the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics in Lausanne. And since uh, 2011, she is a senior research assistant here at the CIB, where she continues her work on uh, in silico drug design for cancer immunotherapy. Um, so Ute areas of expertise, among other, are computer-aided computer drug design, docking, homology modeling, and classical molecular dynamics. Today, um, Uta will, talk, uh, will share with us a work on computational drug design for the therapeutic targets in cancer. So Uta, thanks for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Diane. Thank you all for being here, it's the nice weather and the upcoming holiday. Um, so my talk will be a bit divided in two, so I will first speak about one uh, specific target in uh, cancer that we've been working on for many years now, and the second part will be about some methodological developments that we are doing. And <clears throat> so the first part is uh, about indolamine 2 3 dioxygenase or IDO1, which is an important target in cancer immunotherapy. Um, IDO1 is a... Um, enzyme that catalyzes the rate-limiting step in the mRNA pathway of a tryptophan degradation, and this pathway has been recognized as one of a central, of being of central importance uh, in cancer um, because it's used by tumors to <coughs> evade the immune system. Um, it has been shown that the depletion of tryptophan and the accumulation of tryptophan uh, catabolites induces T-cell energy and apoptosis. Therefore, IDO1 inhibitors are in development for cancer immunotherapy, and importantly, these inhibitors are not thought to be used as a single agent therapy, but in combination with other uh, strategies, such as immune checkpoint inhibitors, for example. Um, how do we go about, very roughly, um, to uh, design um, inhibitors for IDO1? So the first step, is uh, done on the computer. It's uh, done in silico and mainly by myself and uh, Vincent Zouet in the group. We then go with our ideas to uh, the chemists we collaborate with uh, who are located at EPFL and if a compound is synthesizable, they will try to do so. Uh, they come back to us with a synthesized molecule and at the moment it's myself who does also the enzymatic testing. Um, then successful compounds will in the following be tested in cellular tests up in Epalange by Anasli, Dilek, and Milita Irving. Again, successful compounds can be moved into mouse models that are currently being developed by Anasli. And of course, the final goal of the whole story is to go into clinical trials at the sheep. Um, I will just really very, very briefly show one approach that we use. So one approach we like is fragment-based uh, drug design or discovery. And this is just one example. So here we docked a um, small fragments into the IDO active site. This is the structure of IDO, which is available. Here we docked a small benzene ring, a small triazole ring into the IDO active site. Our algorithm detects that those two are in a good position to be linked to each other. We do the linking, we dock again the resulting molecule. And if we obtain good results for this, we go to experimental testing. So we did it for this, sorry for uh, this compound, and it actually proved to be uh, active in the micromolar range on, uh, on IDO1. Um, in the next step, we try, of course, to optimize these molecules, again, using our docking strategies and so on. And for this specific scaffold, um, so me, meanwhile, synthesized about 130 compounds for us, and roughly half of them were active. 
at least in the micromolar range. And this might not sound so great, but if you compare it to a brute force approach, so we had some collaborators in Belgium that said, okay, we'll just buy everything that has the scaffold and that is commercially available. They did so, they got 200 triazoles and they actually found only two to be active. So it is quite a, um, a, a good way to, to design new compounds. Um, of course, we looked again at the, uh, at the confirmation of, of these derivatives that we uh, synthesized in a few, um, or part of the structure of typical relationship you can really understand from the classical docking approach that we use. So here we have our parent compound. We see that in this position, there's not much space in the active site. When you put a substituent in there, the activity drops, while we see that in this position, the meta position, we have a bit more space. We have a small sub pocket. If you put a chloride ion in there, we can increase the activity by a factor of eight. And also, if you do internal hydrogen bonds within the, the ligand, we can uh, obtain uh, better compounds. But this, in case of IDO, it's only part of the story because, yes, you do have the protein here, but you also have this very important new cofactor, the active site. And there, things become a bit more complicated because in order to calculate really binding energies or binding strength between a small molecule and this uh, heme cofactor, you need quantum mechanical methods. And so we turned to, um, to this approach here. And there's just a small slide to show that really the binding strength is strongly modulated by the, um, by the identity of this compound. So here we see that really the deprotonated compound binding to the oxidized <coughs> form of the uh, protein gives the best uh, binding energy. And um, so our calculations, these and more calculations, we did show that electronic effects strongly modulate ligand binding strength. So at this point, you could say, okay, these are only calculations. Can you observe this also experimentally? And the answer is yes. And um, so for this, I'll show you this slide. This is a 4-phenyl imidazole, or PIM. It's a classical IO-1 inhibitor, which has been co-crystallized um, in the, in the enzyme in 2006. So we know that this is binding to PIM and how it is binding to IDO. And here in red, I marked the, um, the nitrogen atom that actually binds to the iron in the uh, heme core. And over the years, we and um, many other people have tried basically every possible bioisosteric replacement of, uh, of this ring here. So all these compounds are very similar. They do have exactly the same shape. They all do have this nitrogen in the right position to be able to bind to the iron. But when you go to experimental testing, you see that actually almost all of them are completely inactive. And the only active compounds are actually the, so the uh, imidazole and then the one that I showed you. So yes, also experimentally, you can show that these subtle electronic effects are very important to develop good ideas. Um, all these calculations that I showed you, so the um, classical docking together with the quantum mechanical calculations, they allowed us to develop a good uh, QSAR model, so a quantitative uh, structure activity relationship that explains the, the observed activities of the different compounds. We only need two terms, one based on the classical docking, one based on the quantum uh, model to, to obtain a very good and when you look at this graph, you see that there's one uh, very good compound here in the, uh, in the lower left corner. And this compound we call MMG0358, it is the best compound we've developed so far. It um, shows a good shape complementary to, to the active site, it forms a hydrogen bond with a serine residue, and it has this chloride ion in the position that I showed you before. And when we tested this in uh, the enzymatic assay, we got good nanomolar um, activities. It's also very active in cellular assays, both on IEO and high, most IEO. And interestingly, it also shows a very high selectivity for IDO over TDO, which is a related enzyme, and it doesn't show any uh, cellular toxicity. So these were very nice results that we obtained. And in the following, our collaborators and process <laughs> also tested this in a uh, in vivo model on mice. And here, I just want to remark that in this case, it's a single agent therapy, so the only thing that is any advantage to the mice. And remember from the first slide, in principle, IDO inhibitors are thought to be 
radiation therapy with other strategies, but already in the single agent therapy, they could observe a significant change in the mice as compared to the uh, control group. And so, all right, this was the, the, very, the first part. Um, in the second, um, uh, second um, part, I will uh, try to show you a bit of a different strategy to come up with initial scaffolds over the bleed component. Because I mean, during all this work, we noticed that a really difficult step is to find the initial active scaffold that then you can try to optimize to increase uh, different properties of the compound. So we had the idea to kind of put a step zero to our pipeline and to initiate the whole thing by actually doing a screening. And this was made possible by uh, the presence of the biomedical screening facility at PFL, which at the time had basically two compound collections. One is the uh, Prestwick Chemical Library, which is composed of 1,200 FDA-approved drugs. So screening those is interesting on the one hand side in the perspective of drug repurposing. So uh, it's quite fashionable at the moment to, yeah, to do this, to test known drugs for other indications and see if you get hits. But it's also very interesting because about all of these components, there's a lot of data available. So bioavailability, uh, safety, but also a lot of other, um, lot of other data is there. And on the other hand side, we used the uh, Maybridge Hit Finder collection, which is a discovery-oriented collection of 40,000 small molecules. So it's not a huge high-throughput screening, but it could be done in a reasonable amount of the instrumentation that, uh, that is at hand at EPFL. And these compounds are supposed to have drug-like properties and a high diversity. And this is just an example from one of the 384 well plates that we screened um, during this campaign. And you see everything looks really nice. We have our negative control on the left-hand side, the first 32 wells. These are the uh, library compounds. And then on the right-hand side, you have our positive control. That is a molecule that we developed previously. And you see that we have a very nice signal-to-noise ratio and, um, and uh, good hits there. And so on the y-axis here, you have the high throughput screening score that basically goes from zero, which is the average for the negative control, to one, which is the average of the positive control. And when we used this um, approach, we got a nice hit, hit rate, both for the Crestry Chemical Library and for the Maybridge Hit Finder collection. Everything was very nice. And the problems actually started when we went to the experimental follow-up for these hits. So that's an example of one of the molecules from the Cambridge uh, hit, fi hit Finder Library that we obtained. Um, and things look very good when we first did standard assay and also again in the lab. So we get a nice uh, dose response curve and things look good. And we became suspicious of this uh, type of compounds a bit later. And we decided to actually add some nucleophile to our assay uh, solution to see what happens. And what you observe was really a very strong shift of the S50. The compound basically became inactive because now instead of apparently covalently modifying IDO1 in order to inhibit it, it was acting, um, reacting with the nucleophile. So it was a strong indication that this is actually a reactive compound on a specific um, IDO inhibitor. And this is a second example. So the molecule looks very similar. It just basically changed the position of two uh, halogen substitutions on it. So you might think, OK, this might do the same thing, but no. It actually does something else. So here, you see already a suspic suspiciously steep dose response curve. And actually, it's known that these uh, steep curves often um, are a product of aggregation. And uh, in order to test this, we added some detergent uh, to our solution. It is as it has been uh, suggested by Cherche and co-workers a few years back. And again, we see a strong shift in IC50, indicating that yes, this is probably just an aggregator. So going through the list of hits that we obtained from the discovery-oriented um, library, we noted that mainly almost all the compounds that, we, um, that were detected as hits um, were promiscuous compounds, either of 
because of chemical reactivity, redox cycling, iron chelation, aggregation, interference, with the assay readout, because there were dyes. So this came as kind of a shock, and it also took a bit of time to discover all this. Then we discovered that actually we're, of course, not the first one to, to have these type of problems. And actually, over the last years, there were a lot of uh, cheminformatics filters um, published to detect exactly these type of problems. And the most uh, prominent one is this PANES assay, uh, the PAN assay interference compound filter, I'm sorry, filter, not assay, um, which is used very widely. And I think maybe because of this very nice company. And actually, I really personally prefer these uh, Lily McChem rules, which are published by Yellow Lily and Company, and uh, which are also yeah, smart filters to detect uh, all kinds of problematic compounds. And then there are other others, and I will not mention all of them, but this one is another nice one for IDEO because actually um, it has, so I think some of the problems that we see are actually that uh, compounds will react with uh, cysteine residues that are in the IDEO site, and in that way inhibit IDEO. So it's nice to detect these kind of problems. And in order to assess our own compounds, and also compounds that are in the literature, supposedly as IDEO1 inhibitors, we uh, made this uh, radar, scar, uh, radar um, scheme for compound classification. So on the upper part, you have the three filters that I mentioned before, and we give a score of one if a compound passes the filter, a score of zero if it fails the filter. And on the lower half, you have um, experimental uh, data for the compounds. So uh, enzymatic ligand efficiency and cellular ligand efficiency, which is basically the line of divided by the compound which gives you a measure of how good and efficient a compound is. And when we look at these, um, look at this data for three of our top hits from the Maybridge Hit Finder collection, um, we see so from the screening, we get a very good score. So all these are basically as good or better than our control compound. When we look at these uh, classifications, we see at least the two on the left are really bad, so they fail all of the three filters. And here, this is mainly because of the genome um, scaffold that is hidden inside. And also, this actually has a bit more hidden, but it's also a genome-like structure. Um, with this compound, we lost quite a bit of time because we thought it wasn't so bad. You actually, you see it fails only one out of the three filters, and it looks quite efficient. But um, in the end, we concluded that also this is actually a promiscuous inhibitor, and it's a Michael, it does Michael to uh, some parts of the protein. So these are bad examples. And this led us to the question, okay, so why, I mean, promiscuous inhibitors, okay, they exist, but why do we have at least so many among, uh, among, our, among the hits that we observed. And um, a partial answer to this is probably that um, the enzymatic assay solution that we need in order to have an active compound is quite, to have an active enzyme is quite complex. So IDEO is a redox enzyme, so we need um, reducing agents in the solution to have active IDEO. We need catalyzer to destroy H2O2 that the solution that can inactivate IDO. And then, of course, we look at the enzymatic reaction. So we need oxygen, tryptophan um, in solution. We will form this product during the enzymatic reaction. So there are really many things in solution. When we add a small molecule to it, um, we can observe the two reactions that we ought to observe, but there are many other side reactions that uh, take place. And this is why we're actually very happy about a new development, um, a new machine that was recently bought by the Ludwig Center for Cancer Research at the UNIL, so by the Kukos lab up in Etalange. It's a Biacore um, SPR device, which um, allows to detect, which is so sensitive that it allows you to detect the binding of a small molecule to a uh, macromolecule, to a protein. And in this way, doing these type of experiments, we can greatly reduce the complexity of the uh, assay solution because we don't need to observe anymore the enzymatic assay, uh, sorry, the enzymatic reaction. So we don't need any of these compounds in the solution. We just need to reduce IDO uh, during, uh, during the assay. And another nice thing is that this really allows you to measure 
a quantity of the KD or the, which is uh, directly related to the uh, binding free energy, which directly relates to quantities that we can calculate with our computational approaches. So this really um, nice, uh, a nice uh, device for us to use and we're looking forward to doing those experiments. And just to finish a bit on a lighter note, so we did not observe only promiscuous inhibition in our uh, high throughput screening. We only found, we also found a few specific compounds. So these um, antifungal imidazoles, they all, 10 or 15 of them in the uh, Prestrig library, they were all detected to be uh, IDO inhibitors. And we believe that those are really specific IDO inhibitors, which have a good score in the screening and they have no problematic uh, that were detected in the filters. And with this, I'll just come to a very last slide about IDO. It's a bit to put our work into relation with what's uh, currently available. So this compound is in a phase two clinical trials now. Um, it's the most advanced compound um, developed by Insight. Um, there's a compound similar to this one. It's not exactly this one, but something similar to this one. It's also in clinical trials developed by New Link Genetics. Here you see our compound, which really has a very good profile. Um, in the properties that we looked at. Then you have a classical uh, ID1 inhibitor. It's a tryptophan analog, L1-MT, which has also very good properties, but it's not very efficient. And finally, recently, uh, these type of compounds have also been pro-crystallized with ID1, and uh, they uh, are very interesting. So, so much about ID1 for the moment. Um, I will just to the second part of the talk, which should be a bit, um, a bit shorter. It's about some methodological uh, developments that we are doing and that are by, mainly being done by uh, Prasad in the group. And these, um, so we're trying, I showed you before that we use many different methods, uh, theoretic methods to try uh, to do drug design. And Prasad is trying to really use um, or yeah, put it in a regular framework to use uh, quantum calculations coupled to classical calculations to use them directly for being on the fly in docking. And what I mean by this, I will explain in the next few slides. So here again, some very basic notions about how we do uh, ligand protein docking. So we need a, a 3D structure of our target. It can be a X-ray structure, it can also be a G model. Um, then we have different methods to design the ligands. We can use databases. We fracking based approaches or anything you can think of. Um, then we dock this compound into the target binding site, which means we try to find the optimal position within this uh, within the receptor. We do geometry optimization to obtain the energy, the estimated energy of this. From this, taking also solvation into account, we can estimate the KD of this complex. And with this information, we go back, we design new ligands, and the cycle many, many times until we find a molecule that has good properties. Um, the challenges in this um, type of approach to, 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 yeah, to, to calculate, um, calculate KDs is that uh, you cannot treat chemical reactions. So whenever a bond is formed or broken, you have a problem because you actually have to define in the beginning where are your bonds and what it's like. So here we have um, an example of an EGFR bond to athletinib, which is actually uh, making a, a chemical bond, a covalent bond. And another problem that is difficult to treat in this approach is polarization. So when you have a highly polarizable ligand, this, the, its charge distribution will change in response to the uh, environment that it's in. And this you don't capture in this classical. And um, yeah, so, so probably you're not all familiar with uh, what, yeah, what is a classical docking approach or how does it work. So in this approach, for each molecule, be it a small molecule, be it a protein, DNA, whatever you want, um, you define the atoms of your, um, of, your, of your molecule. So each atom is assigned a radius, a mass, a partial charge, and uh, 3D coordinates. And then you define the topology. So you say this 
atom is bound to this atom, the line, the bond length is one point uh, whatever angstroms, and uh, basically you define bonds as a small springs, and then you do the same for angles, diameters, and so on and so forth. And when you do a geometry optimization of this uh, compound, as an output you get new coordinates, which correspond to the minimal, um, or the most optimal structure of this protein, and you get an energy, which leaves you, um, yeah, which is associated with these new coordinates. Um, on the other hand, you can do the same using a quantum approach, which is, which is a more physics-based approach. And here, you actually don't know molecules anymore. All you know is, on the one hand, our atomic nuclei. So each nucleus has a mass. It has an integer positive charge, which is given by the number of protons that are within a, within a certain chemical element. And it has, again, 3D coordinates. And then the second ingredient of your system are the electrons, which are negatively charged, um, which hold the system together, and uh, which obey the laws of quantum. So, a uh, quantum approach. And again, you can do geometry optimization. And again, as an output, you get new coordinates and new energy. But in this case, you also get additional information. So you can get a new topology and a new charge distribution. So you get additional information out of this approach. And of course, it also has a drawback, so that's uh, computer time. Usually, um, the more high level your quantum approximation is. And it's very impractical to treat a full biological system with a quantum method. And that's why um, people have part of this uh, QMMM approach. So the bulk of your biological system, uh, you will treat with a quantum, uh, sorry, with a classical method, what I've shown before. And then you just choose the subsystem, basically the active site of the enzyme or wherever um, chemistry is happening. You choose that part of the system and treat it by the, by the QM, um, QM method. And of course, the trick of the trade or the real uh, science is on how do you treat the interface between those two, um, between those two uh, systems. And I don't know if you might remember, but this is exactly the type of approach that uh, two years ago the Nobel Prize was given for. So Martin Kalpus, Michael Levitt, and Ariel Warshaw, they were attributed the Nobel Prize for developing this type of uh, QMMM um, approach. Um, all right. So, I see the time. All right, so um, I will show a few results from Prasat. It's really just a few slides. Um, we applied this QMMM docking or scoring function docking uh, approach first to zinc metalloproteins because they are very diverse. They are yeah, omnipresent in all our major enzyme classes. And this uh, zinc atom in the active site actually induces a strong polarization, um, which is a problem for many classical uh, docking algorithms. And it's also very uh, suitable because there are many uh, high quality structures available in PB, so for a benchmarking set, it's very uh, convenient. And last but not least, many of these uh, zinc metalloproteins play a role in uh, cancer development, so they are interesting as, uh, as, as a target, too. Um, before showing you the results, I would just very briefly visually show you what we call a success in docking and what we call a failure. So our reference is always an X-ray structure. Here on the left side, we have a small molecule binding to a, a zinc um, within an active site, of course. Um, if our docking pose, it's here this uh, purple, this purple pose in the middle. If the overlap with the original, with the X-ray structure is good, so um, the RMSD is below two angstrom, then we speak of a success. And if this measure, the RMSD is above two angstrom, so here you see an example uh, for this, where really the uh, ligand is completely flipped around and not in the good position, then we call this a uh, failure. And when we look at this um, observable for a test set of uh, 230 uh, zinc metalloproteins, treated either <coughs> with a classical scoring function or the cumulative scoring function, you see that we get a significant improvement um, using a cumulative approach. 
um, which is due really to the better description of uh, polar relation and charge distribution um, that is induced by the zinc atom of the component in the active site. And here, yeah, that's just one example from, from, this, uh, from this benchmark set. Again, you have the X-ray structure in, in orange, so this is the correct solution. This is the solution that we get with our QMMM docking um, approach, so you see really a nearly perfect overlap between the pose generated by the docking and the X-ray structure. It's a very good, it's a very small RMSD. And these two codes, Autodoc 4, Autodoc Ena, are classical uh, docking codes that are freely available. And you see that Autodoc gets the um, ligand confirmation completely wrong, so the two rings are actually exchanged, the whole ligand is flipped, and the RMSD is very big. And this Autodoc Vena also gets, gives you a good result, so the RMSD, based on the RMSD, it's a, uh, it's a success. But actually, if you look at the details here on the ligand, or the zinc binding functionality, you see that it actually the ligand binds with the wrong atom. This is, of course, a very important. Okay, so just one last example for, uh, for the secure minimum docking where it works very nicely is also this uh, TNF alpha converting enzyme taste, which is also called, uh, called uh, ADAM17. And um, it is known for the system, it's known that binding of the ligand influences the acid dissociation constant of an active site glutamate. And just by chance, we have 50 complexes of this uh, enzyme in our large benchmark set. And when we looked at the result for this uh, sub, sub uh, yeah, for these 15 complexes, we were very surprised to see that actually there was a really big uh, gap between classical and experimental results. Classical didn't get any of the poses correctly while human was perfect um, perfect success. And this prompted us to look closer into what's happening here. So here you have an animation of a um, hydroxamic acid ligand binding uh, to this uh, taste. And you see the active site here. So now we have also the protein around. You see the active site, the zinc ion, and the hydroxamic acid ligand binding to, uh, to the active site. And what's actually happening, it was very quick, but it did in a second, is that a proton jumps from the ligand to this active site uh, glutamate. And then this uh, bond becomes a bit shorter in the ligand. She shows a very good binding energy. So once again, there's the proton sitting on the ligand, and then it jumps to the uh, to the uh, carboxylate of the glutamic acid. So these are exactly the type of topological changes that you can see in the QM approach that you will not see in a classical approach. And for this, I'm at the end. I would just like to to give a little outlook on what else you can do with this type of approaches. And it's more a toy system than a than simulation, but um, of course when you treat an enzyme, you would also like to know really what's exactly happening, how is the reaction exactly taking place, and this can also give you, of course, insights into what is important or what should the key state on the uh, inhibitor look like. So we looked a bit in more detail into this um, dioxygenation reaction of tryptophan to anorene. So here you have L-tryptophan bound in the IDO1 active site. It makes nice hydrogen bonding interactions with this arginine, so this kind of blocks the tryptophan in, uh, in the good position, and it also has a good interaction here with this uh, carboxylate. Bound to the heme, you have the dioxygen, which first attacks this carbon atom, so you saw one oxygen is transferred to this carbon atom, which in the following will form an epoxide, and later on move really to this carbon atom, now. So this gives way to the second oxygen atom to attack again the same carbon atom. And then the system relaxes, and this is basically almost in the form of chimerine, so the uh, um, reaction product it just needs to detach from the from the heme and to cleave one more your reaction product. But this is just for your system. So with this, I'd like to come to an end and to uh, acknowledge the work um, of 
uh, all collaborators for these projects. So, as I mentioned, for the QMM uh, development, it's uh, the work of Professor Chaskar. Um, the chemistry is done by a SOMI, SOMI Red, Ready Magica Group, in, uh, under supervision of KFL at uh, EPFL, and everything that pertains to modeling is done in collaboration with Red. And I would like to thank, of course, the Vital IT Group for the essential amount of uh, computer time, the BSF at EPFL for screening support, um, Gilbos for help. And yeah, the National Science Foundation.